existence of white supremacy. To know your history is everything, no matter who you are, especially black, because you're constantly being told that you were nothing but a slave, constantly. No one began as a slave. That's not what God put you here for. If you know anything about the history of slavery, that's the first thing that they, they did. They beat your history and your native tongue out of you. And what's amazing about America, even the state of Texas has, the school board is now expunging slavery out of the books. So they won't have to be held accountable for what they did. It's gonna be difficult for people to prove intellectual inferiority. That's why even in our textbooks in school, they don't like to teach our children about black inventions. Because even greater than our African history are our American inventions. Because from nowhere, you're coming up with things that revolutionize the American social and economic order. Well, basically, there is a proverb that says that the only thing that peoples of European descent ever created was the patent office. Because they stole everybody else's ideas and put their name on it. During slavery, because you were the property of your master, a lot of what we invented was automatically given credit to the master. The credit was forwarded to the master because we was property. We weren't allowed to take fame or notoriety for the things we created. Anything that made work easier. Why would white people want to invent something that make work easier when they had black folks to do it? You have a huge incentive to try to get things uh, to move smoothly so that you, know, you don't get any more lashes. You know, or somebody doesn't now have to sell someone else in your family. You know, you know there, were, there was a lot of incentive to create, uh, create inventions. And that's another thing. Most of our black inventors had to deal with idea theft. White folks would come in and say, we did it first because we didn't necessarily know the process or have the money to patent our inventions. So white folk will find out what a black person invented and go do it real fast and get their application in because back then the process wasn't as thorough as it is now. Whoever got their application in first to the patent office, that's who got the patent. So we got thousands of inventions by black people. We'll never even know it because of the fact that they were stolen. They don't want anyone to know that we invented things. So if, it, if it wasn't for black people, white people couldn't take a dump. A black man invented the toilet and he just made it white on purpose. A slave by the name of Black Sam, Eli Whitney's slave, created the idea for the cotton gin, and his master took it and patented in his own name. How could he do that with no benefit of books? He wasn't even allowed to learn. A lot of people assume just because African slaves were illiterate, they were ignorant. And there's a real big difference because African people, they had a very elaborate language or, or elaborate languages over in Africa. When Africans were brought over here, they were taught a bastardized version of English, and they weren't even allowed to see the, the language written down. And they were taught the language by lower class Europeans who were living in the South. So even though there was that major obstacle, blacks still did phenomenal things. Thomas Edison was known for stealing people's inventions. He was known for taking the inventions of a few African-American inventors. Um, Louis Latimer, um, Granville T. Woods actually went to court with Thomas Edison and Granville T. Woods actually won his case. Thomas Edison tried to bring Granville T. Woods to court on that invention. And I just saw a commercial for Mazda, I believe, cars, where they said, here's a man holding a thousand patents. Well, 90% of them he stole. Alexander Graham Bell and Thomas Edison, who are probably considered America's two greatest inventors of all time. But guess who was designing their uh, blueprints for the patent application? A black man. Now let's think about this for a minute. If you invent something, why do you need me to do the blueprints for the patent application? If it's your idea, how in the hell can I do the blueprints for it? You can't do the blueprints for my idea. I have to do them. So if Latimer is doing the blueprints, if he is your chief draftsman, and he's doing your blueprints for your patent application, Alexander Graham Bell, did you invent the telephone? Or did Louis Latimer invent the telephone? Thomas Edison had a whole troop of people that was in his sweatshop and depending on the invention, he would hand it over to that particular department and tell them, see what it is that that does and then do something a little different and we'll patent that. 
And when they took, when he took Granville T. Wood's information and tried to make it his own, the court said no. The watermelon and black people stereotype, that came and that was popularized by Thomas Edison. Um, around 1890, Thomas Edison put together this Nickelodeon reel. And uh, there were these African-American men who were joking around, shucking and jiving, and, and kind of mugging for the camera. And they were eating watermelon. And Edison filmed this put this out and the general public saw this and they said, okay, African-American people must really love watermelon. And right after that film came out, thousands of postcards and all types of memorabilia flooded the market of African-American people eating watermelon. So that watermelon stereotype was popularized by Thomas Edison. A lot of people don't know there's an African-American male who is significant, has patents on the first major computer chips that made computers operate other inventors that we don't know about, essentially, who they call the father of the internet, was Philip Imegwali, a Nigerian man who essentially created the connection for quantum bits of information so that multiple computers could actually communicate with one another. During slavery, and this is well documented by white people, many of the masters, when they were sick, did not call for the physician. They called for the big mama on the plantation, and she would come with her medicine bag. They didn't have alcohol and rum. They had all types of things that she made from the herbs that she had planted. Some of them said, I don't want the doctor. Bring me the witch doctor, that voodoo woman who I own. Africans took what they brought from Africa, which would be a ground hockey, and all they did apply the game to ice. When the British were, were fighting the United States, there were African slaves or former slaves assisting the British in fighting the U.S. When the U.S. won and the Britons lost, many of the African Americans were sent to British colonies in West Africa, and many of the African Americans were sent into Nova Scotia, Canada. And they formed what we now know as hockey. They started to play this new game called hockey, which was something that Africans were doing in Africa. In ancient Kemet, there was a form of field hockey that they were playing. And they went into to Canada and they created what we now know as hockey. And there were actually black Canadian hockey teams in the early sport of hockey that a lot of people don't know about. And there's a great book about that called Black Ice that talks about the early inventors of hockey who were men of African descent. The baddest cowboy, black or white, this man was so bad that they called him the invincible one. Just to say that there was nobody better than this man in the West, and that's been co-signed. The brother's name was Bass Reeves. Now, Bass Reeves was a former slave who pretty much beat up on his master to get away. When we think of runaway African slaves, we always think of the African sneaking away in the middle of the night, hiding, ducking and dodging behind trees, hiding in bushes, hiding in rivers. Bass Reeves decided he was not going to be a slave anymore, and not only was he not going to be a slave, he told his master, I'm going to beat you up before I leave. So he beat up his master, escaped and got away and went into Oklahoma, which was like an outlaw territory. So he actually got away and became very prominent in the Old West. When they began to open up the Oklahoma Territory, they needed to recruit people. And they recruited him because he knew the Creek language, uh, he knew the Muscogee, uh, he knew how to speak the Seminole language, he knew all of the natives of the, of the area, and he sat with them to learn about their traditions. The real life of this black man, Bass Reeves, became the mythic legend of Hollywood white cowboys. He brought in 3,000, count them, 3,000 bad guys. I'm talking about the worst murderers. He got 3,000 of them, killed 14. All of who the Lone Ranger became when you saw him on TV was actually the life of Bass Reeves. African people, in many ways, the Underground Railroad, established African people moving west and establishing places to be able to protect them. And so in the study and the research of the Underground Railroad, you will find that there are African, African-American communities that were established and have been there from before people can actually talk about it historically. Many people don't realize that African-American people founded and settled many cities around the country. Um, Buffalo, New York was founded by a black man. They called him Black Joe Hodges. Um, 
Many African American people had a less volatile relationship with the Native Americans. A lot of the European settlers, they were beefing with the Native Americans. So they couldn't go into certain areas in peacefully. But a lot of African American settlers would go in there and they had somewhat of a camaraderie with the Native American people. In Los Angeles, 44 African American families came to Los Angeles and founded Los Angeles. Um, the governor of what was then known as Alta, California, which is now the state of California, the governor was a man of African descent named Pio Pico and there's a street out here in Los Angeles called Pico Boulevard named after him. You had an African-American woman named Biddy Mason who was a very wealthy landowner in early Los Angeles. So African-American people were very prominent in founding many cities around America. Chicago was a city founded by Jean-Baptiste Pointe du Sable, a, a brother of Haitian background coming up through and, and founding this city at Chicago because that is what the indigenous people called it uh, in this part of Illinois. Now Seneca Village really is a misnomer for, for Senegal Village. Seneca Village was a community in New York City that was uh, purchased by freed Africans. When the enslavement of African people was abolished in 1827, Senegal Village became a meeting place for African people in general. The backstory, it is believed that Senegal Village became part of the Underground Railroad for African peoples. Starting in 1855, you're going to have people start to call it a shanty town, where people who are squatters live. They're going to demean the importance of Senegal Village. Going to say, you see, you see all these African people moving up in here, and they're squatters, they don't belong there, and we need to create a park. And so they begin to put themselves upon the people. Finally, the mayor signs an edict saying, eminent domain, you gotta get out. And so by 1857, the last Africans were forcibly removed from their homes. What's interesting about Central Park, it was once an African-American community, Seneca Village. And now there's a, an ancient African monument. There's an obelisk in Central Park right now. That's from ancient Africa, from ancient Kemet. And a lot of people don't even realize it's there. A lot of people think that the enslavement of African people was only down south. That's not true. The largest plantation in the 13 colonies at one point in history was in Brooklyn, New York. And you know that area down there, down by Battery Park, where they, they used to bring the ships into that area, the port? And they would dock the ships, and they would bring the Africans up out the ships, and they would walk them across to be sold. However, what they did was, because they couldn't free uh, sell all of them, they used to put them in different prisons along this particular path. And then they would march the Africans that they were ready to sell down the street, down a street called Wall Street down into a place we today call the New York Stock Exchange. African people were the first stocks and bonds sold on the stock exchange. There's a movie by Bruce Willis that will show you the prisons that are underground, the stock exchange building. Wiley Jones was a former African-American slave who went into Arkansas. He stacked his money up and he became a railroad owner. He owned a railroad system and the city of Pine Bluff, Arkansas ended up buying his railroad system and that system is still owned by Pine Bluff right now. The Patterson Car Company was a car company founded by former slaves, African-American men, and the Patterson Car Company was the first African-American car manufacturer in the country, One of the, I think the only manufacturer in the country. And what's interesting about the Patterson Car Company, it was in Ohio. Their cars were considered higher quality than the Model T cars that Henry Ford had. The Duray brothers, Ford and them stole it. That's why all over the world, Ford never gets credit for inventing a car. He gets credit for mass production. The cars began coming off the assembly line at the rate of one every 40 seconds. Until that, they take one car and put it together. One car and put it together. But where did he get that from? George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was never around black folks till he went to Tuskegee. The mother and father died or was killed. And a white family adopted him from Iowa. You know, black folks in Iowa, such football players. Hmm? So he went to grade school, high school, and they didn't have no secondary school. They didn't have enough people. Hmm? 
And so now George Washington Carver leaves after you get all this education came out there. He goes to Tuskegee. Henry Ford came down to visit like he always see his friend. He said, Mr. Ford, Mr. Ford, I got something here. Study plants. And see, if you take this back and give it to your engineers, they can build more than one car at a time. He took it back. Mass production all over the world is called the plant, right? Everybody made joke of him because they said, well, you know, but the plants are talking to him. You know, is, is this how he's getting these, these, these properties of these plants? And George Washington Carver, in his quiet, dignified way, said, well, who taught me? I'm not saying that they talk to me like they got a tongue, but I can look at a plant and see what it can do for the human family. The military came to George Washington Carver, and they said, we need you to do something for us. Can you invent something that out of it we can get paint, glue, ink? And plastic. Young Howard. They tell me how smart black folk are. Young Howard. So he came back called Soybean. Now you want to hear something funny? The number one cancer group in America is vegetarians. Because <laughs> you weren't supposed to eat soy. When he got to Tuskegee, they thought he was gay. No association with women, high pitched boys. They thought he was gay. The finest juice we've been able to make of peanuts is in the treatment of the after effects of infantile paralysis. And he'd rather for you to believe he was gay than tell you that them white folks that adopted him castrated him so he couldn't have sex with their daughter. Like, who wanted them, huh? <laughs> Do you see King Kong? New York City, Empire State Building? That's about Jack Johnson and the white ladies. Why would the gold really go to New York? They ain't got no bananas and Lord, no ain't no trees. Why did they go there? The boxing capital of the world is Madison Square Garden. If you don't know how to break it down, you Johnson controlling the pace of the fight. And... We have to understand that in our celebration of Jack Johnson and that one-on-one, -on mano a mano, man, this is you and me, and this is what we're going to deal with. There were lynchings the day after every fight. And that's very important to understand as it relates to the psychology. He used to love to drive. He used to love the speed. And he'd be speeding someplace, and the police would stop him. And because they saw that he was a person of African descent, because they saw the car that he was driving, some may have known who he was, but they said, well, what is this man doing with this car? They would find him. They'd say, OK, we're going to give you a ticket for speed. His $500 ticket. $500 for speeding back then? Story has it, he'd give him a thousand dollars, he said, because I'm speeding back. <laughs> in the sport of boxing, there has always been a need for the great white hope in boxing. Um, since there could not be one in real life, Hollywood just created one, and that's what the Rocky movies were about. Uh, they were giving out the awards in Rocky won, okay, to Oscar. And Muhammad Ali came out, and he was the one that gave Sylvester Stallone the award. But, <laughs> can't you feel working? I'm the real Apollo, please. You stole my trip. And Ali, in his most powerful way, came out and said, you know that story was about me. He said, you know that was about me. You know that y'all dream about beating a black man. He said, but you know what? The only place you'll ever do it is in Hollywood.